Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to I Sell a Bird. This is David Ringer from New York. And you may be able to hear just outside my window some of the cheers that people are giving for our healthcare workers and other essential workers at seven o'clock every night. So I do want to start the show by thanking all of our healthcare workers and other essential workers for all they're doing. So I saw a bird today. It was a group of herring gulls flying over my neighborhood here in New York City. And the herring gulls nest on the green roof of the Javits Center, a big convention center here in New York. How about you, Christine? Hey. So I'm Christine, and recently I saw a classic bird. It was a blue jay. So it always brightens my day when I see a little flash of blue across the sky. That's great. They're beautiful birds. Well, for those of you following along with us, put your bird sightings in the chat. We'd love to hear what you're seeing, and we may share some of those later on in the show. This is a big week. It's one of the biggest weeks of bird migration during the entire year, and so we've got a great show for you tonight. Uh, we're very excited to have our first two guests. We have Dr. Adrian Doctor, who's joining us today from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. He uses weather, weather radar networks and individual tags on birds to address questions in migration ecology, including when and where birds migrate. We're also joined by Dr. Nat Seavey, who's Audubon's Director of Migration Science for the Migratory Bird Initiative. Dr. Seavey uses the wealth of scientific knowledge about bird migration, to engage people and protect the places that matter most across the Americas for birds. We're thrilled to have both of you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Great to be here. <laughs> Hello. Hey. So because the theme of our show is, of course, spring migration, I have a question for both of you. So that is, what is your favorite migration story? So we can start with Dr. Doctor and then we'll go to Dr. CV. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, there's so many good migration stories, but one that I have to think of uh, immediately is like I've studied a lot of my work has always been to look how birds are, are using actually weather to, to, to migrate. And they're, they're incredibly smart in doing that. And uh, when I came to the US, uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands. When I came to the US about uh, four years ago, uh, there was this really great example that you see every year, and it happens when, when there's actually hurricanes moving over the U.S. It's always, they have the most extreme weather here in the U.S., and, and hurricanes are one of them. And of course, they're terrible. But one of the things that I noticed when, and when we were using the, the weather radar networks, actually, is that um, sort of in, in the, these enormously strong winds that the hurricane are causing, if you look sort of in the sections of the hurricane where, where the birds have good tailwind, you see that they immediately uh, make use of that. So you see major migration in, in sort of the flanks of these hurricanes where birds use these very strong winds to sort of, yeah, get, get a ride on the wind and migrate much more efficiently than would ever do. So we saw on the radar that birds are really getting incre incredibly high speeds. They're tiny, tiny songbirds, but like they're going like 80, 90 miles an hour, approaching 100 miles an hour. So that, that's really amazing. And it shows you how clever these birds are in, in, using, in using the weather to, to, to move. Yeah, that's such a cool story. Yeah. How about you, Dr. CD? Yeah, so this time of year, one of the birds that I'm always thinking about are golden crown sparrows. So I live out in California and during the winter, golden crown sparrows are a really common bird around here. And and just always enjoy them so much. They're a species that I've been able to work with a little bit with some of my colleagues at Point Blue Conservation Science. And from that work, we know that those birds leave right about now, the end of April, the beginning of May. And they're going to fly about 2,000 miles up to their breeding grounds in Alaska. And they'll do that, that migration will take them about three weeks. So they're covering about 100 miles a day. And you know, those birds are going to these incredibly remote regions of, of Alaska, and it's just so neat for me to think of them departing here and, um, you know, spending their winter here with us in a, in a, you know, in people's backyards and then going to these extremely remote areas and how they connect us to these remote wilderness areas of Alaska. Yeah, I love that. And I have a photo of a golden crown sparrow up on my screen, um, up on my screen right now. So it's a really cool photo. Yeah, beautiful bird. Those are both really great to hear. 
And we want to remind our viewers to drop your questions for our guests tonight in the chat. We'll pull some of those out and get your questions answered. Uh, but we want to keep going now and Dr. Doctor ask you a question that we've heard from some of our viewers on past shows, which is how and why birds migrate at night. Yeah. Yeah, that's, of course, that indeed is true. Like almost 70, 80% of the birds that migrate through the U.S. actually do that at night. So it's, it's really, it's not, a, it's not a small portion, it's almost the majority of all birds. And, and the reason is, well, there's multiple reasons. And actually, scientists are still debating actually what, what is the exact reason. But the one very important thing that we think is, is a reason is that it's just a very efficient way of spending your day. Like if you migrate at night when you cannot really eat, because it's dark, then uh, you, yeah, there's not much else to do. So you can migrate during the night and then you have the next day when you need to refuel for your next flight, you have the whole day to forage. So it's a very efficient time use. On top of that, it's also like um, at night, of course, there's also much fewer predators because they usually hunt like, like uh, falcons and they, they, hide, they also typically um, hunt by sight. So at, night, at the cover of night, you're much more safe. That's, a, that's another really good reason. And I think another, maybe the, the third reason I, would, I could think of is that there's so many cues also that birds have at night. You can see there's a nice stars are out, uh, which birds may use to migrate. The winds are typically a little calmer and, and, the, and the weather is a little nicer. So there's all these advantages that you have when you migrate at night. Uh, and so I think in, in a way, when you think of it, then you can, might always turn it around and it's why, why do actually some birds migrate during the day? Because that's actually maybe what we are, wondering. <laughs> that's maybe more, a more difficult question to answer. Yeah. Yeah, that's really a good, good point. Stuff. I've never thought of it that way. Like, why don't they migrate during the day? So um, I know Dr. CV, you study migratory birds. So my question for you is, how does migration science help inform conservation work to protect birds in the places that they need? Right, so, you know, if, if we think about these migratory birds that are, are just departing or just arriving right now, you know, these birds are essentially going on a road trip, much like you or I might go, right? So, and they've got some sense of where they're headed and what they'll need along the way, right? They're going to need to fuel up Right? We just heard about how they may migrate at night in order so that they can pack their days full of feeding and refueling. And so they're expecting certain things to be there along their way and then certain conditions to be there that they need for, for nesting. And so from a conservation perspective, our job is to make sure that those resources that those birds rely on are there in the places that they expect them to be and at the times they expect them to be. So anything that we can do to make sure those resources are is there is great. So from a science perspective, what we need to do is understand where those places are. And what's interesting about that is that, you know, for a long time, it was really difficult to get the big picture of what bird migration looked like, right? So. Um, rather than seeing what a trip or what, what the entire bird migration together looked like, it was as if we were just studying bird migration by you know, going back to that road trip analogy. It was like we were just you know, camped out at one gas station trying to understand people's trips from just looking at what was happening at that one gas station. But today what's incredible is that we've got all these different tracking technologies, radar, all sorts of different tools that are allowing us to get a much more comprehensive picture of what are the important places and how we can protect them. Well, that's a great segue to something that we want to pull up on the screen and talk about with our viewers. Um, this is a tweet that caught our attention this week from a professor at Colorado State University. And uh, Dr. Doctor, I want to ask you to talk our viewers through what we're seeing here. This is in the Florida Keys. Um, talk us through what's going on. Yeah, this is a really cool event. And basically, to orient you, you, you see in this, in this little loop, you see the tip of Florida on the south. And on, on the south of the image, there is the island of Cuba. And the, the movie loops sort of through one night. So it starts at sunset and, and continues to till sunrise, so it's all at night. But the radar can detect uh, what's in the air at night and you sort of see this wave of birds arriving uh, or moving over the gulf there. So it's, it's most likely these are the birds that have made a stopover or that are departing that have been wintering in Cuba. 
and that now uh, take the good winds from the south to migrate towards the US. So that's this sort of big blob that you see moving uh, northward. Those, those are almost all birds. Um, you also see these little speckles that are moving uh, a little to the north. That those are little rain showers that also move towards the north. And therefore you can see that birds actually are, they're not stupid why they, why they choose this night. You see all the rain showers are moving to the north. And that's, that's, that shows that there's a good tailwind. And that, that's why birds on this night took this mass takeoff from Cuba uh, towards, the, towards Florida. So this little loop takes, about, takes them about six hours to fly that nonstop. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty impressive flight. Um, but we know of even more impressive flights. Birds do this also over the Gulf of Mexico, where they depart from the Yucatan. And, and, and on average, that takes them almost 22 hours of non-stop fly. So they're really impressive uh, uh, events and, and, and we're really interested in these sort of barrier crossings. Of course it's a dangerous journey for a little bird to fly over these open water. So that's why um, Kyle probably also showed this case. It's a really spectacular case. Yeah, it really is. Thank you for that great explanation. So um, you work on this a lot. Uh, and in fact, Cornell Lab of Pharmacology has created a platform that is using radar technology for the explicit purpose of monitoring bird migration. Uh, so I think you're going to share that with us and talk through what BirdCast is and how folks can benefit from it. Yeah, I, I want to show you, give you a little tour of what BirdCast is. And uh, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you a little bit about the website uh, where, pe where, where, you, where you can see these kind of uh, forecasts and observations that we make. So th this is a, um, I, I hope it's visible, it's a little map that I show here. So this is on our website uh, called birdcast.info. Um, uh, and this is a subsection where we see uh, the live migration maps. So they're maps of the US where we can sort of look in real time what migration is is occurring and we started already for the, the current day they're already live but for the purpose of now I show you I'll, sh I'll show you what we saw yesterday so um, this is sort of slightly before sunset if I look through it you see this red line coming through the through the image that's sort of the sunset uh, moving over the country from from uh, from east to west and you see directly behind it you see all these bright yellow colors popping up and that was, that was the bird migration of last night that's starting. Um, you see a lot of movement here along the Gulf Coast, over the Appalachians, all these yellow colors. Uh, and birds then start to migrate and continue. And you see sort of how the patterns of the US change during the night. So you see birds moving away a little from the Gulf Coast. There's, uh, and, and birds moving into New York. A very good migration night also over the over uh, California and Washington. So you see, this is really one of the peak uh, one of these peak nights that we had last night. And we can also look at um, migration. For example, uh, uh, we are not, not not only making these live migration maps. There's also forecasts that we are making of when migration will happen. So that, you see that on the landing page of Birdcast, where we see these predictions. So we've made sort of with computer models that we have trained on uh, historical radar observations. Uh, we can make sort of forecasts based on the weather, almost like a weather forecast, but then for birds. So you can look like next day and three days ahead how migration will be and where migration will be. So that's very handy also if you if you plan your birding trip, when, when to expect the birds and when not. Um, so this night it looks pretty good also. It's not, not as good as yesterday, but some interesting rain also over the east of the country that birds may bump into and that that's maybe some dangerous situations for them. And that, that's also one application that we use these forecasts for. Uh, we have now a pilot in Houston and Dallas where we try to generate these warnings from when these peak migration events are happening and to encourage people then to turn off their lights uh, on buildings and on uh, on people at home also, because we, we found in earlier studies that birds can be, especially when it's rainy, they can get attracted to sort of bright lit structures and collide with it and, and it causes a lot of mortality of birds. So because we can now forecast when the birds are happening, at least we can warn people when, when these dangerous events are. 
events are and hopefully uh, prevent these collisions uh, by, by encouraging people not, not to, turn on, to turn off their lights and have a nicely dark sky where what, what the birds of course have evolved under. They, they're used to dark lit uh, nights when they can see the stars. Um, yeah, that, 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 that would be ideal for the birds. So, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. So, folks, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> folks, thanks. Folks can find the link to BirdCast in the chat. Uh, keep your questions coming. We'll turn to those in a minute. And uh, you mentioned, Dr. Doctor, that people can use BirdCast to find birds during migration. How would you advise people to use this tool to better their own birding during spring migration? Well, I would first maybe I would first always look at the forecasts and see more or less when when is a good night coming and and, and sort of um, uh, and and I would also encourage you maybe if it's a really good migration night maybe step outside once and uh, in, in a nocturnal uh, in the middle of the night so about two three hours or ten eleven o'clock at night and listen into the night sky and then you hear all these little chip noise and little thrushes. And they're really tiny chips also, but, but if you have a good night, you hear them all the time. And that these are these thousands and thousands of birds moving over your head. Uh, so you, that makes it real. And of course, once you've looked at the forecast, I would turn to the live migration maps to sort of uh, click there and see, and see what's happening uh, at your location, more or less, at that time to see, to see uh, where, the, where the peak migration is. Um, and if it's in your and if it's in the site where you are, step outside and maybe you hear something, yeah. Because yeah, it sounds like it's all under the cloud of darkness. But if you if you, if you have a good ear, you actually hear all these little migrants uh, moving over your head. Cool. Thanks for sharing this. I'm currently in Dallas, so I'm very excited about the Texas forecast. I'm going to start using this tool. So. On to Dr. Steve, I have a question for you. So you've worked a lot with birds um, out west in California, and that's where a lot of our food comes from as well. So my question is, how can farmers and ranchers help protect our migratory birds? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, this the map that was just up was a really good illustration of that. So um, you might have noticed that if you looked at California on that migration map that um, was shown, it the over the Central Valley is lighting up, right? And, and that's because the, the Central Valley of California, which is a really important um, area for, for food production in California, is also a really important place for migratory birds. Um, a lot of shorebirds and waterfowl either spend the winter there or stop there on migration. And some of those birds are using the wetlands in the wildlife refuges, but a lot of them are also using flooded agriculture that's adjacent to it. And that those flooded agricultural fields before they're put into production provide really critical habitat for birds. So when we think about it, you know, I think it's, it's really easy to think that um, there's the places that people use and the places that birds use and those are two separate things and we go to you know wilderness areas to enjoy birds but really what it is is that there are places that the places that people use and the places that birds use they really need to be compatible with each other and so looking for solutions where we can find ways that we can grow food and provide habitat for birds those are really critical um, pieces of conservation Another example of that is thinking about conservation and ranching and whether there's opportunities out there that we can, um, by promoting um, good grazing practices, we can keep grasslands and grasslands and make sure that we have habitat for migratory grassland birds. So there's a lot of exciting examples of that, of thinking about how humans and birds use those same areas and, and we can generate multiple benefits from places like that. Thank you for that. So keep your questions coming in the chat. Uh, one of our viewers, Rebecca, wants to know how urban development shapes migration patterns. Uh, and Rebecca says, Adrian, that she knows some of your research is centered on light pollution, which you mentioned, and how that affects bird migration. What else can you tell us about that? Yeah, so that seems that's an important thing. Like, of course, cities and, and, and buildings, they're, they're one of the brightest things that, that migratory birds encounter when they're migrating. And there's one, one study where we have explicitly uh, looked into detail 
into that. And that's when the tribute to light in the U.S. Uh, in New York City is is uh, is on. It's sort of a memorial uh, for the 9/11 attacks, and there are two very bright columns of light that um, that sort of mirror the, the the twin towers. And these these columns are so bright that they also are, they may be the brightest lit structure on the planet. And and of course, 9/11 is in the middle of migration time. And uh, what we've seen is that there's huge numbers of, of migratory birds that kind of get trapped in, into these beams of light. Uh, and we worked very closely together with um, New York City, all of them also to sort of temporarily shut down these lights when too many birds get trapped. But it it's, was sort of an interesting experiment where we really saw this really strong a, a attraction effect of the, of the lights to birds and also how you can, yeah, by, by just turning off the lights, birds find their way again, even on a brightly lit um, um, city like New York City. Um, but, but it's very conceivable that similar attractions also happen like in this football stadia and, and all kinds of bright buildings uh, that can happen. So um, yeah, and, and then I think it, 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 it's, it's um, yeah, especially then when, when there's also poor weather, you know, it's not always a problem, I would say, maybe brightly uh, lit structures, but especially if there's already challenges like um, fog or there's, some, or there's precipitation and the birds have already a bit of a hard time, they can get totally disoriented by this, by this bright light and, um, and, and, and actually even cause mortality. Another thing that we also see is with, with uh, other studies that we, for example, with eBirds, this is an, a, um, a program where people can just hand in their, their, their bird observations and we, and we make models of distributions of birds on the ground. And there we see this similar strange effect that in the fall, there seem to be sort of this disproportionately high number of birds in the cities. So what's the exact course we, we're still trying to figure out that light could be one of them, right? That, that maybe young birds are attracted to these bright cities and, um, and sort of end up in a habitat that's not optimal, of course. And, 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 and yeah, so in that sense, it is a bit of a problem. And it highlights also the, maybe the importance of the city parks. We see that in the, in the radar data also, there's huge emergence of birds in city parks and they're very important cores of sort of habitat that are still in these urban areas. And, and in that sense, very important to have these urban parks in, in a good condition that birds can also find food there and stop over there because we, we might actually pull them in a little bit there. Yeah, that's a really Thank good point. And I, I really love that story about the tribute and light because I, I actually had the opportunity to help document that as a video with Audubon two years ago, um, also working with New York City Audubon. And I just think it's such a great example of how we can work with um, the city to help both birds and people. So that's a, that's a cool story. Um, so now I have a question for both of you again. Do you have a spark bird or a spark moment that got you into studying birds? So we'll start with Dr. Stevie this time and then we'll go to Dr. Doctor. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things that really launched, launched me in this direction was um, it was early in undergrad, probably 1992, and I took a, a course. I was a student at the Evergreen State College, and I took a, a course from Dr. Steve Herman. Um, and he was an ornithologist, and um, he would take a group of students into Eastern Oregon every summer and um, band birds um, kind of at the end of the breeding season leading into fall migration. And so, there I was, and you know, all of a sudden, um, just surrounded by people that were so passionate about birds. And I can remember the the first bird that I banded was a, a Wilson's warbler, um, and just you know, being in that position of being so close to that bird and knowing the the migratory journey that that bird was you know on its way south, um, headed to probably you know. I don't know back then that we had nearly as much information about this, but today we know that those birds, um, the birds from uh, Western North America go into Western Mexico and, and spend the winter in Mex Western Mexico. And it, you know, 
that was really a, a moment where I recognized that there was an opportunity to, to study birds and to work for their protection. Um, and I just feel so fortunate to have um, been able to pursue that as a career and, and now to have a position at Audubon where I'm able to continue that work. And I'm really excited about that. That's an awesome bird. What about you, Dr. Doctor? Um, yeah, I, 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 I had to go back, I think, to also to where I grew up. And that was uh, in the city of Harlem, in, uh, close to Amsterdam in Holland. And one of these really nice sounds that you always have in the summer are the, are the screaming swifts of the city. They're not chimney swifts, but they're common swifts, but they're very closely related. And it's also like this really fascinating bird that always, that always got me hooked and that really drew me into studying birds because Swiss are kind of the ultimate flyers. They, they kind of, um, oh yeah, they have a nice picture. You see these really, really sharp wings, uh, really fine wings, and they're just these acrobats um, and they, they sort of live their entire life on the wing. And so if I would say sit in Amsterdam on a little terrace, you would have this, these screaming parties of birds going around it. I think they all know each other. And then in the evenings, they sort of go around screaming and then you see them disappearing really high, uh, really high in the sky. And then they, they sort of, we figured that out also with the radar that actually, that they actually don't really go to land. They just spend the whole night on, on the wing flying. They, they really sleep on the wing. Um, and, and it gets even crazier. Like a few of my colleagues in, in Lund University and in, uh, in, a, in the Swiss Ornithological Institute, put little tag, tags on these birds and uh, little tags that record whether the bird is actively flapping or not. So you can see when it's flying and when it's not. Uh, and then they release these birds and then they migrate all the way to, to Southern Africa, uh, even to South Africa. So a crazy long journey all the way from Western Europe. And basically what they found is that birds basically don't come to the ground at all. For, for almost 220 days, they're on the wing and flying around. And, 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 and they sort of gives me a different perspective of what airspace actually is, right? It's not just something that you move in or move around. For, the, for these birds, that is, that is their habitat. That's, that's all they ever see. And, and that's where they mate. That's where they find their partner. That's where they migrate all their life is sort of spent in wings. So for me as a migration ecologist, this is really the ultimate flyer. And I think it translates also to the chimney swifts here that I now stare at and I wonder, do they do as crazy things as the, chim as the common swifts from Europe? And one thing is very fascinating already that, that the, the chimney swifts that we see here, they, they, you see them in the summer and then they start to migrate to South and Central America. And basically there they disappear off our radar. There's no radars there, but also there's other Swiss species there. Basically, they disappear in the Amazon and, and we don't really know where these birds are going uh, and what they're doing. So, I don't know, it's something about Swiss. They're so mysterious uh, that there's a lot, like years of more research uh, possible into them. So maybe I can do my next study on chimney Swiss now, I hope. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a cool one. So thank you so much, both of you, for sharing all your knowledge and expertise. I think we all learned a lot here. I definitely learned a lot. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome. That was very nice. Yeah, thank you both very much. And folks can find more with the links in the chat box. We appreciate you both. Well, it's truly a pleasure to introduce our next guest, Jane Alexander. Jane is an avid birder and a wildlife advocate who sits on the National Audubon Society board. She's also a well-known actress who has received a Tony Award for The Great White Hope, two Emmy Awards, and four Oscar nominations for films like Kramer vs. Kramer and All the President's Men. She's an author, and she led the National Endowment for the Arts in the 1990s. Jane, what a pleasure to have you on tonight. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, Jane. Well, I'm going to... Hey, Christine. <laughs> We're going to start with a hard-hitting question, Jane, so I hope you're ready. Why birds? Why birds? My gosh. Well, what else? There's about 10,000 species in the world. Some of them, almost all of them fly. Some of them dive. Some of them swim. Most, many of them. And uh, they go on land too. They do everything. And they're everywhere. So they really are the species that, I mean, birds monitor the earth. They tell us when it's healthy. 
when it's not healthy. I really uh, appreciate what um, Adrian was saying about uh, about that too. That cities, you know, we need to we need to understand the habitats of all of these wonderful creatures and and, and support them and and protect them. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. So we are on the topic of spring migration. So I would like to know, Jade, what kind of birds have you been seeing so far this season? Well, um, I'm up here in Nova Scotia, which is on a migratory path. I'm, I live very close to the southernmost point of Canada. So the spring and fall migrations are pretty spectacular here as well. And um, what I've been seeing now, I saw a great bird today, a winter wren. Uh, wrens are, are rare in uh, Nova Scotia, but I think winter wrens are really making a stronghold now because I was doing my breeding bird survey last uh, June and I had six winter friends, uh, winter wrens that were breeding clearly. So wow. uh, I think that they're coming in and that means probably that house wrens and Carolina wrens aren't too far behind. I hope so. They're, so let, winter wrens came in today and um, I've had uh, the three war warblers that are the early ones, palm warbler, pine warbler, and yellow rumped warbler. And I'm waiting for more warblers to come in because they're some of my favorite spring birds. And I know one of the birds you also like to watch up there is the common eider. I'm gonna share a picture that I took visiting you a few years back. You wanna tell us about the eiders? Oh, eider are spectacular sea duck. In fact, people here in the coasts of Canada call them the sea ducks. And um, these are all the females, this picture that you're seeing right now that David took. They are real feminists, <laughs> eider, uh, in, the, in, in the bird world. These are all female hens and those, they raise the chicks communally. So they're taking them out and they, these chicks look to be about, to me, 10 days old. And these hens are teaching them how to surf the waves, how to dive under the waves, and they have to learn a lot. Um, so it, it's absolutely adorable to see them all together. Sometime last summer I saw 35 uh, young ducklings with about six or seven hens uh, taking them around. And it was um, just wonderful, wonderful picture, David. Well, thank you, Jane. Uh, one of the things you also do in Nova Scotia is you're a piping plover guardian. This is a picture of you out there on one of the beaches doing your thing. What does it mean to be a piping plover guardian? The piping plover, which is an absolutely wonderful, adorable looking little bird. Um, Certainly the chicks are, and maybe Christine has a chick co picture coming up soon. That is an adult, but- um, Yeah, I'll show my screen. I have a little video. <laughs> okay. There's only about uh, eight, 9,000 piping plovers left. They're in the, the Great Lakes area and they're in the Northeast part of the United States uh, for breeding purposes. And they need all the protection that they can get. Right here in Nova Scotia, they're suffering from rising tides and washouts of their nests, which are right on the tidal fringe, the high tide area. And <clears throat> they're also suffering from predation, uh, where um, fox, seagulls, crows, you name it, coyotes, uh, will, will take the birds, the, the young ones. So uh, it, it, we have to, as piping plover guardians, we go out, and we monitor where they are, how they're doing. We keep our distance because they're shy and the pipe, piping part of the piping plover comes because that's how they warn their little chicks about a predator in the area, including human beings with a little beep, beep, beep. I can't do it. <laughs> that sounded good to me. Okay. <laughs> Well, Jane, one of our viewers, Tina, wants to thank you for all you do for birds, uh, which I think a lot of us agree with. And that's a great segue to our next question, uh, which is you, talk, you spend a lot of time talking with people about the role that they can play in helping birds 
and in how to avoid getting overwhelmed. So what advice do you have for people as they're thinking about conservation and how to help birds wherever they are? Well, as I said earlier, I do feel that birds are, they are the canaries in the mine for the planet. And if we protect birds, we are probably going to protect most human problems in the world. That sounds a little far-fetched, but think about it. Clean water, clean air, uh, good agricultural practices uh, are all very important. So how can we as a layperson help the scientists and uh, the farmers and everybody? I think what we can do is we start locally. We start in our own backyards or in our own little area locally and get to know the habitat and what lives there and then learn to protect it. And what, I don't use any pesticides or herbicides uh, because there's quite a few of my, um, my birds are, are eating those things and that will mm -hmm. harm them. And it will also harm our water, ultimately working our way up to um, human beings. So then the next thing I say, join a local organization, then a regional or national one, something like if you love National Audubon like I do, it's a, it's a natural to join that because you also have the 450 chapters across the country and centers to go to as well. And also global because I'm sitting here in Canada and Canada shares its birds with the United States and with South America, Central and South America. So all of the Americas are part of our birds, most of them. Although there is one bird, probably the most incredible flyer in the world, or one of them, the Arctic Tern, which breeds right here where I'm um, in, in Canada, is the southernmost uh, area that it breeds. And it travels 30,000 miles a year to South Africa. So it crosses Amazing. continent, <laughs> the ocean and continents. But so if, if each one of us just join three organizations, start locally and think globally, <laughs> and then work your way up to a regional or national organization that you can support because these are great scientists that are involved with these organizations to save birds. And then you work to a global one as well and take as many trips as you're able to take in your backyard and everywhere else. Yeah, exactly. I love, I love how you say that start local, start with your own backyard, and then eventually you'll be able to find a community of people who share your passions and then you can move up from there. So that's right. Mm -hmm. I, just, I got a, a, an email just yesterday from one of my goddaughters who lives in Queens, New York. And she showed me very proudly that she has a pair of morning doves in her little bird feeder. I don't know if they're nesting there or what, but how wonderful that they came. They're not pigeons, they're morning doves, doves. How wonderful is that to have them right out your window? So that's her backyard and she's taking care of them. Yeah, that's cool. actually, that makes me remember the first, one of the first childhood memories I have of birds are, a, it's a pair of morning doves that they would fly back every year and they would nest in the same area. So mm -hmm. that was really cool. And that kind of sparked my interest in birds, one of many. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you. So in 2016, you published a book called Wild Things, Wild Places. And it's a firsthand assessment of what is being done to help the planet's most at-risk animals. So my question is, do you have a favorite bird story from that book? <laughs> well, uh, you asked, uh, the fellows about the spark bird. So mm -hmm. my spark bird is the wood thrush. And here's a wonderful picture of a wood thrush. And um, they're beginning to come in now in, in um, areas south of Nova Scotia. They don't come to Nova Scotia very much, wood thrush. But it is my favorite bird. And the reason is because I find the song of the wood thrush the most ethereal, and chilling and beautiful of any song of any bird that I've ever heard. And maybe it's because it was my spark bird and the bird when I was younger, I heard it and I, I would wake up in the morning and hear it and I would hear it at night as well. And my husband and I had a place in Putnam County, New York for 35 years when the kids were younger and, and these, there was a one wood thrush, we called the grand old man, and he sang 
like Pavarotti, that's all I can explain it. And it is as if the woods every night would stop and listen to him. And we would stop and listen to him because he had such an incredible voice. So not all wood thrush that everybody's going to hear are going to sound like the grand old man. I haven't heard many in my lifetime that sounded like him because birds learn their songs from other birds. Usually their parents, uncles, aunts, things like that. That's such a cool fact. They're such a beautiful bird too. David, would you be able to pull up a, a wood thrush song and show us or um, let us listen to see what they sound like? There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So soothing. It, it, it's wonderful. Uh, the wood thrush and the hermit thrush and a few others have a double voice box. And that's why they're able to make those double sounds. Um, and it, it's, it's unique. Not many birds can do that. Not many creatures have double voice boxes. But the best way to hear them is not by tape. Clearly, it's to go out into the woods early in the morning at dawn. In May, in the New York area, it would be around mid-May. And you and you will hear them. I, I still remember the first one I ever heard, Jane. I was on a camping trip in the Ozarks of Missouri, and I woke up in a tent right at sunrise and was hearing this incredible noise that filled the whole forest and just couldn't imagine what it was. It was amazing. Ah, oh, great, great. Yeah. Well, Jane, uh, shortly before the pandemic descended on the United States and disrupted all of our lives so much, you starred and finished a run of a play on Broadway called Grand Horizons. And one of the things that those of us who got to see you noticed is that in between acts, there were bird sounds filling the theater. And I know that you had some strong opinions about that. So tell us a little bit about the play and about the birds who starred in the play alongside you. <laughs> well, the play took place in a retirement village called Grand Horizons in, in the Delaware uh, area. and. Um, I, I noticed during um, our, our late rehearsals that this, the audio engineer, she was putting in all these bird sounds. So I just, on my own, I was vetting them to make sure that they were right for the Delaware area. <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, I know pretty much the Northeast uh, uh, birds in Pennsylvania, uh, particularly in New York and so on. But uh, it turned out at one point I said, you know, you have a Eurasian collared dove in there. How I knew it was a Eurasian collared dove, I knew it wasn't a morning dove. So I, and I, and they are been coming in, they're an invasive, but they have been taking over the area. And I said, that's really unusual, but it's good <laughs> that you have it in this state. And she said, well, I just have birds from Pennsylvania. <laughs> that was the take. <laughs> so it all worked out. Well, thank you for that attention to detail because a lot of films and other artistic productions don't bother to get the bird songs right to the locality. I know they use uh, red tail hawk for the eagles and everything. It's, it's shameful. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll do a segment about that on one of these I Saw a Bird episodes. So <laughs> if you've noticed that in film or TV, drop a comment for us. We may follow up on that. Um, so Jane, you've also been active with the Audubon Christmas Bird Count for many years, especially the Putnam Highlands Audubon Society Count in New York. What keeps you going back year after year? Oh my gosh, it's just, it's just the collegiality. I love being with uh, fellow birders. Um, I actually love going out. The, the, the Christmas Bird Count can be <laughs> very cold and stiff. I remember one time our team of five was reduced to two of us, me and another fellow, and we went out because it was a raging blizzard. <laughs> I think if we, we got literally five species in, in the, the 18 hours we were out or something, it was so stupid. But it's, it's fun to try, it's a challenge, it helps us know more about birds and what the, they're doing in the area. And it is competitive because you have teams. And it's, it's wonderful because it serves the science of Audubon at the same time. Well, Sounds like you. it's been a fun and exciting experience. 
Um, and we thank you for your dedication to go into all these Christmas bird counts year after year. Yes, yes, I've been, and I do uh, another one in, in Westchester, Bronx, Westchester as well, uh, which is a lot of, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So before you mentioned the, some of the bird species that you've been seeing this year so far, what I want to know is what spring migrants are you excited to see coming up? Oh, yes. Well, like many people who love birds and spring birds, uh, oh, yes, here's a, here's uh, my bog. You can see that the little mm -hmm. pink ones are the orchids and the um, maroon kind of flowers are pitcher plants. Those are uh, like Venus flytrap, but they're not quite as snappy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the insect goes into a little cup that's hidden in the grass there and feeds the plant. But what lives in this particular area is a blue-headed vireo. They, uh, they should be coming in soon into those trees. And then red starts and um, common yellow throat closer to the water and yellow warblers and magnolia warblers, which is the most common warbler here in Nova Scotia and uh, black-throated green warblers. The ones that I'm not seeing anymore are Oh, there we go. That's the magnolia. <laughs> the magnolia. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the black-throated blue warbler. Yes, that I Beautiful. only see passing through. It doesn't live in my woods because it likes um, a different kind of uh, lower swampy area. I mean, lower shrub area than what I've got. And, oh, yeah, the birios and yes. So, um, um, that's what I'm, I'm waiting for. And uh, that last year was really pretty disastrous. We've had e enormous winds here in Nova Scotia because of climate change. And uh, the ocean is warming up more than it ever has. So the wind comes in earlier and is ferocious. In fact, day before yesterday, we had Seven, um, 36 hours of 70 to 90 mile an hour winds. Now, I have not seen many birds that I had before this storm, after that storm. Uh, I've out, been out walking a lot today. I did see, hear the winter wren deep in the woods and I see the robins are incredible. They just hang on, they, and so are the song sparrows and the swamp sparrow. But um, the other birds that I had, some of the warblers just, I don't know where they went after that storm. I hope they come back. Uh, but we're, we're seeing an awful lot of changes and a lot of birds simply can't m make it during these um, radical changes. The tree swallows, for example, were here. They were practically building a nest in the tree swallow boxes. They have not returned since the storm abated yesterday morning. Mm. So. It, it's problematical and tree swallows also are having a tough time because they're aerial insectivores and the aerial insects are declining at such a rapid rate globally that um, these swallows don't have that much to eat anymore. Well, we hope your pair will come back soon. Jane, we have a comment and a question from one of our viewers named Terence for you. Mm -hmm. And Taryn says, wow, you're one of my favorite actresses, so I'm not surprised you're a birder. You're awesome. <laughs> Thank and you. then what do you want? Yes. What Terrence wants to know is whether you see puffins where you live in Nova Scotia. Oh, well, I do, actually, Terrence. Thank you. Um, right out my window this way, I, there is an island called Ram Island, because in the old days, they would put the sheep out on the islands because they didn't have to and they just bring them back and forth with boats um, and let, leave them out to fatten out through the summer. Well, we don't have sheep anymore, but guess what? 15 years ago, we got some puffins out there for the first time ever recorded. And um, we still have the same number of puffins because Ram Island has also been occupied now by a lot of other different kinds of seabirds like uh, guillemots, the wonderful birds with a red mouth inside and red feet at about 13 inches and um, common murs and the whole island is being taken over 
because the puffins started it. They found the crevices in the rocks in which to breed and they started it. But now they've been swamped <laughs> by all these other birds. So I, I don't know how long they'll last, but yes, they're right out there. Thank you. That's wonderful. What a great bird. Well, Terrence, thank you for that question. And Jane, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure having you on. We love your work on stage, on screen, and of course, on behalf of the birds. Thank you for spending time with us tonight. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you. And it's great to be able to do this for Audubon. Yeah, All right. Stay safe up there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. yeah. So during this time, a lot of us are spending time at home and we're all finding comfort in the nature around us. So for some bird photographers, that means turning their lens and pointing it at some of their own backyard birds or even the birds right outside their own windows. So in light of that, we're launching a bird from home project. And it's for those who want to document the I saw a bird hashtag that we've been sharing on social and those who want to document that in photos. So I'm happy to have Sabine Meyer again. Hello, um, who is Audubon's photography director. And we're also going to invite conservation photographer and filmmaker Morgan Heim, as well as Audubon's director of social media and storytelling, Preeti Desai. Thank you, uh, Christine, um, and um, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to have a chance to chat tonight with, or today, with both Morgan and Preeti um, about this brand new project we just launched today online, Bird From Home. Um, and um, they're both gonna share the photos they take from home. Um, we're gonna start with Morgan. So Morgan, you are a regular contributor to Audubon. Um, you photographed the cover story of the winter issue of um, Audubon magazine um, last, um, last June, I think. You, um, the story was on Chinese Crested Turn, and for that you would travel to a very remote island off of China. It was quite an adventure. Um, but now, during the pandemic, um, you are uh, sheltering in place in Astoria, Oregon, and you're taking photos in your own backyard. Um, so, Morgan, you, you're going to um, walk us through your pictures, but before we start, I wanted to um, ask you this question. So, do you have a routine for photographing birds at home, or do you just grab your camera when you see a bird and just get going? So. Um, well, it's, it's a bit of both actually. So um, I, I definitely have been learning the habits of the different birds that are in my backyard. And there are certain pictures I'm, I'm often thinking about storytelling shots. So I, I will strategize on how to kind of conceive those ideas and, and execute them. And then I will kind of prepare my spaces so that it's very easy for me to take advantage of something when I see something exciting happening when I'm not expecting it. So while I'll, I'll put aside chunks of time each day to, to just sit and observe, I also almost always have my camera within reach in case something cool happens. Uh, because a lot, they, they are just like active outside all the time throughout the day. So um, I don't want to miss anything exciting. Well, let's start looking at pictures. All right. So um, let's all right. So hopefully this is showing up. Um, so I'm I'm turning the lens on my own backyard, and while I want to get photos of you know all the birds sitting on beautiful branches and things like that, it's really important to me to to pay just as much attention to how the birds are using the human spaces that are all around. So all of our structures and things like that, because that is a big part of the story of backyard wildlife or just yard wildlife, anything you're seeing outside of where you live. So I really combined this mix of, you know, looking at things like the Northern Flickers who are excavating this tree. I, I was hoping they were gonna make a nest in that tree and it turns out that it was just a really rotten tree with lots of good food in it. So um, they, but they come and they feed there every day. Um, and then I look at how birds, whether they're native or not, this is a Eurasian collar dove, um, but he loves to land on this particular pipe that is uh, coming out of my neighbor's uh, greenhouse. 
And then he stands atop that and sings. And I think he's trying to he, attract a mate. Um, he's trying very earnestly to attract a mate. And it's really important to really understand how the various structures around your house are um, helping the wildlife to survive in these urban areas because that you are doing things like providing nesting places for them um, and feeding stations for them. So by watching like the black cat chickadee checking out this birdhouse, I can see like whether or not he chooses that location. And if he ends up not choosing that birdhouse, I can then do a little bit of research and think about, okay, what might make a better setup to encourage nesting and give these birds, you know, more habitat to, to want to raise their young there. So you get to know your birds, but you also research their behaviors so you can maybe um, anticipate some pictures or some setup you may want to take. Uh, take. Yeah, like that with that birdhouse, the chickadees, um, they checked out that house a few times, but ultimately have not nested there. And so I was reading up on them and I was reading that for black black hat chickadees, they actually prefer houses that are more kind of sheltered under trees. So this this bird house is next to my house, but it's not under any trees. So I might try moving it to a different location, and maybe next year they'll decide to nest in that that box. Um, and then I most of my yard, I don't feed my birds a lot. I have one bird feeder and I'll put seeds in it and I get this lovely pair of pine siskins coming down to feed at it multiple times, almost every day. And they're really bold. Um, but I think that, you know, bird feeders, you can do a lot of research on that, on, on the right kinds of food to give them and uh, to really foster the birds that are in your areas. And um, it's really fun to see how the birds kind of hop back and forth between just the plants that are in my yard naturally and then this little feeding station. And they actually come down now and they'll eat from it while I'm just sitting on my patio, you know, working at the patio table out back. So Morgan, a lot of our viewers are, they're loving these photos that you're sharing and they're wondering where do you live and where are you seeing these photos? So I live in a small town called Astoria, Oregon. It's, it's where the Goonies was found, which just had its 35th anniversary. Um, and it's just a small town of like 10,000 people on the Oregon coast, right at the mouth of the Columbia River. And it's a really, really great place for birding because we have this convergence of two major rivers and the Pacific Ocean and also um, a mountain habitat where you get, you get all of this cross section of bird life kind of coming together. Um, and it's also in that kind of one of those migratory hot spots that Dr. Doctor showed on his map. I was really excited when I saw that. I wanted to totally check that out to help kind of predict what might be coming my way. Um, Oh, thanks. But yeah, so I, I, I look at really how the birds are using the landscapes and, you know, roof, rooftops are really important. They're kind of very sought after perches for the birds. They, they get good views from there and they can really kind of observe their territories and, and belt out their songs. So I, I almost always immediately look to rooftops when I'm, I'm outside looking for the birds in my backyard. And then the other thing that that's been really great is seeing the different visitors that come like different ones arrive at different times and it's I almost feel like I know the day that they arrive because I hadn't seen them the day before. Um, the very thrush is one of the birds that was coming pretty early on when I started paying more attention to my backyard and it's not coming anymore so it's hanging out somewhere else now. I don't know what where but um, it definitely was one of my earlier visitors. And now I've got new ones that are showing up. I just had some warblers show up today and I got really excited. Yesterday I had some spotted toadies show up for the first time. So to be able to feel that in tune with the activity in the backyard is really cool. Um, this is an Anna's hummingbird uh, female. And I was able to find her because there was a male that's been doing sonic dive bombs in the air right above this bush. And so then I looked down in the bush and I could, I found two females that were just like sitting, hanging out, you know, watching this show. And I'm um, observing things like their nesting behaviors. So a lot of the birds right now are, before they were just feeding in my yard and now they're all very busily collecting nesting material and 
um, my neighbors tore down some hedges next door, which was sad, but then the crows came in and they're like pulling all the vines and stuff that are left on the ground and building their nests out of it. So um, that was like a nice little surprise from watching uh, something that I thought was gonna be bad for the birds. There was actually something good that came out of it, at least temporarily. And then the last thing is when it comes to telling the stories of like the backyard behavior, I really want to think about like, what is it almost like from the bird's perspective and how can I try to convey that? So, you know, I'm a part of the bird's story just as much as the birds are a part of my story. So I'm trying to think about how to do that. And I'm by myself, so it's, it's a little bit challenging, but in this instance, I, I set up my camera on a tripod next to the feeder and um, I'm just triggering it with my phone. There's a lot of cameras now that they have a wireless function. So you can do some neat things with your photography if you set that to a remote function and then take pictures that way. And that's you in the picture over there in the window also, let's uh, point that out. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, that's like one of my favorite perch spots. I can see so much activity from that, that particular spot and there's windows that open on three sides so I always look for like different levels of my house where I can open windows or I have a basement and I use the basement door as a hide and I use the basement window as another hide it's it's a great way to kind of sneak around and get lots of different viewpoints it looks like you match the bird too yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people, oh I'm sorry a lot of people are asking what kind of bird that is do you want to tell us so that's a California scrub jay. I've gotten to do um, two different stories, one for Audubon mm -hmm. on island scrub jays. And now I have California scrub jays in my backyard. And I just, I love them so much. They're so full of personality. And I have a, a pair, a very identifiable pair that has like chosen my yard as the place that they want to be. And I feel very honored. That's great. Um, we have probably just one minute, minute left. Um, you're a senior fellow at the International League of Conservation Photographers, which is a, a really awesome organization. Um, do you want to quickly kind of tell us um, how maybe a project that you do close to home in your own backyard can sort of um, line up with the larger work you do at uh, the ILCP as a conservationist? Um, how are you a conservationist by um, photographing the birds in your own backyard? Um, sure, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I've spent so much time looking at stories that are happening in other places. And I always thought I was a good observer of what was going on in, in my own yard, but just actually turning the camera on my yard this way has made me realize how much I was missing. And, and so I have a much better appreciation for my own specific footprint and, and how that is interacting with the life that's in my backyard. And I was just doing the count today and I've seen over 20 different species of bird that's just right. in my one tiny little postage stamp of a yard. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think about like, you know, what are all the different things that I can do? I let my yard grow wild, which, it, it may, might look a little messier, but the birds really like it. And I don't use pesticides like Jane was mentioning. And um, I just do everything I can to make it a friendly space for them. And then getting a chance to actually document that in a story, um, I, I just hope that it inspires other people to look at their backyards and think about what they could do mm -hmm. similarly to encourage life there. Because I think there's just so much, um, connection that happens and also uh, this sense of empowerment like you can actually do something meaningful um, in your own surroundings for a lot of different life forms thank you so much um beautiful work um and um we're going to turn um the screens over to Preeti. um Preeti, you have been looking at your own backyard um for quite a while now pre-pandemic and um Tell us how um, you decided um, in the first place to focus your lens on what's right outside your window. Um, yeah, um, can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, beautiful. 
Thanks. Um, so, you know, I'm a bit of a homebody, which I guess is a little bit weird to say as a birder. Um, maybe birder adjacent is a better description of who I am. But because I'm home a lot, that gives me uh, good opportunities to check out the latest happenings at my feeder. And I've loved photography for a long time, and nature and wildlife are really my passion. So focusing my lens on my backyard feeders just made sense. I've been, Aud I've been at Audubon for four years, and I've just learned so much about birds in that time. And I've seen that knowledge reflected back to me when I'm observing the birds that I'm seeing every day. Um, there's the obvious, which is figuring out which species are visiting. Uh, I know some pretty basic ones in my pre-Audubon days, you know, blue jays, northern cardinals, American robins. But inevitably, I started learning more species after I joined like tufted titmice and white-breasted nuthatches. Being so focused on my feeders has really brought some cool surprises into my life. One winter, this weird yellow bird showed up that I'd never seen before. Um, and thankfully, I had my camera trained on my feeder at the time, so I was able to capture it. And then I sent it to my coworker at the time, Prubita Saha, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and she ID'd it for me as a pine warbler. And apparently, it was unusual to see this little guy in New Jersey in the winter. So that was really cool. And he came back a couple of times that season and even the following winter. And then, you know, I didn't realize that house finches can come in different colors. This guy with the orangish yellow head showed up one year and it looked like a house finch, but I'd never seen that color before. I'd only seen the red ones. So I immediately Googled and found out that male house finches can express color variation based on their diet. So that was a cool fact to learn and not necessarily something that I would have known if it wasn't for my home feeders. So for me, birding from home sparks a lot of curiosity and you can solve mysteries too. Uh, Preeti, I think there's a number of people wondering where you live. Um... Yeah, uh, I live on the East Coast. I live in central New Jersey. Um, so a lot of these birds are, you know, um, familiar feeder birds in that area. Um, and I get to see all the seasons, like in this photo, this is obviously fall. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, I've learned, I've also learned a lot about the personalities of different bird species. So I know that chickadees are probably the bravest little birds that I've seen. Whenever my feeder is empty, they immediately start yelling at me and they don't stop until I've refilled it. They're just sitting there on the branches, just yelling. It's, it's the best. And then the least brave birds are probably the male cardinals. They'll get scared at, you know, a little bit of breeze rustling the leaves and just fly off. Preeti, what do you find is the best part of photographing birds from home? Um, I think the biggest thing for me with photography at home has been, you know, this fondness for the birds that other birders usually brush aside for the flashier or the quote unquote more interesting species. I think there's just so much to appreciate, whether it's the floofed up borbs on the cold winter days, um, the pair of morning doves that are taking a nap side by side, or the blue jays showing off as they jostle for seeds. I was watching the blue jays, like Christine mentioned at my yard earlier today while I was working. I kept getting distracted during my meetings. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's what we're celebrating with this project. I snuck this photo in um, to show everybody what my quote unquote backyard looks like. It's really just a patio with a tree and a couple of bushes. Every photo that I just shared was taken around this setup and often from this blind. And um, it's really funny to see this blind in a suburban environment when it should probably be in the middle of the woods or something, but it works for me and works for my birds. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, we really wanna see what others uh, like us who are stuck at home are seeing and we want you to showcase the birds that you see every day. So for everybody watching, please share your bird photos. If you're on Instagram, you can share your photos with the hashtag bird from home and tag us at Audubon Society. We wanna turn your photos into an online gallery for everybody to see and appreciate this spring as we're all you know, stuck at home. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Preeti. That's really beautiful work. I know a lot of our viewers are appreciating it through their comments. Um, so we've come to the end of our show once again, and we like to close out the show with saying, if you do one thing for birds this week, I'm giving you something to do. So we're gonna do that now. We heard Jane Alexander talk about how precious 
coastal birds like plovers and other shorebirds truly are. But their habitats are disappearing because of rising sea levels due to climate change and development along the coasts. So we know that uh, wetlands and barrier islands and other natural formations on this earth can help protect our communities against storm surge, sea level rise, flooding rivers and storms, and at the same time provide space for the birds that we love to thrive. Um, but despite knowing that these two things can coexist, uh, an organization in the federal government called the Federal Emergency Management Agency, you might hear it called FEMA in the news. FEMA is focused on projects along our coasts like seawalls and levees that destroy bird habitat and our natural defenses against storms. Um, so we know that there are good solutions that help promote natural defenses, that protect vulnerable communities and give our birds places to thrive. So if you do one thing for birds this week, we want to ask you to write a letter to FEMA, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute, but write a letter to FEMA and ask them to prioritize natural infrastructure solutions, these habitat solutions um, that benefit both people and birds. So I'm gonna show you right now, um, we'll drop a link in the chat, but we've made this very easy for you to do, to raise your voice on behalf of birds in your community. So we're gonna drop a link in the chat in the comment section. And when you tap on that link, here's what you're gonna find. You're gonna find a picture of the beautiful piping plovers, um, and then just a small form to fill out with your contact information so that this goes to the right place. Uh, and then there's a draft message in here. So you may be thinking, I'm not an expert. I don't know all the right terms. That's okay. We've had experts who have put in some suggestions here that you can submit to the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. You can, of course, add to this text box if you want to put in your own notes about your community or the birds that are important to you. You can do that here. And then all you do is click here to send it in. So uh, we all have until May 11th for this important public comment period that's going on right now with FEMA. And we're asking you to make these comments today on behalf of coastal communities, the birds that we love, uh, and then maybe ask a friend to do the same thing. So again, check the uh, chat for that link. You can also go to audubon.org slash protect plovers. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We really enjoyed having all of our special guests. We'll be back again next Wednesday with another I Saw a Bird show. Remember to use the hashtag I Saw a Bird on all social media and uh, the new hashtag to bird from home on Instagram. So thanks very much and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody.